So, so you're saying there's no such thing as coming back from clinical death? There is no coming back from clinical death, and, and let me make this very clear. When a brain dies, the cells, the nerves, which comprise that brain, burst like a water balloon because we have an unrush, inrushing of sodium or calcium, and that causes the cells to lice. There's not, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Once that neuron it bursts, it's gone. Now, when a critical number of these neurons die within the brain, then the whole organ may reach a point where it's irretrievably dead. Okay. Sam, I want to turn to you. Uh, do you agree with that definition of clinical death? Well, I think, um, if I may, I'll take a step back, actually, to sort of perhaps give my perspective on, on what Peter uh, started out with and what was just being said. Um, you have to remember where we've come from to be able to appreciate this question a bit better, which is that... If you think about it, um, um, for centuries, if not millennia, people have tried to reverse death. Who wants to die? Nobody wants to die. People have tried that, and well, <laughs> there are exceptions these days. <laughs> Who used to want to die, they didn't, right? And unfortunately, human beings were not successful at reversing death. And essentially, the way that death has been defined and still continues to be defined in most cases is when the heart stops beating. Because when the heart stops beating, a person stops breathing immediately, and the brain also stops functioning because there's no blood getting into the brain. And that's why people develop fixed and dilated pupils. So you've seen that in the films. Those are the three criteria by which doctors today define death. That's when they write your death certificate. So this perception was created that there is a moment of death that could not be reversed because there was no science to do so. Now, two important things occurred in the 1960s which changed this enormously. And the first thing was that um, there was the advent of modern intensive care medicine, where essentially people who were critically ill, who were going to die, were now able to be preserved using life support machines. So a bit like an airplane that's about to crash, but now you have a system to pull it up and prevent the crash from happening and people coming back out of it. Uh, the second thing that was discovered at the same time, quite by chance, was uh, modern cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, which essentially allowed physicians to restart the heart in people um, after they had gone beyond that traditional threshold of death. So what um, then occurred over the ensuing couple of decades was that actually more and more, thousands, millions of people were now being brought back to life, either because they'd been very close to death or they had temporarily gone beyond the traditional threshold of death. Um, and these people had incredible experiences. They were universal, as Peter pointed out. They described seeing beings of light, they describe going through a tunnel, a beautiful place, having a review, review of their lives, and sometimes watching events that were going on in hospitals. Now, we as scientists, when this was first described, like anything that's described for the first time, were perplexed because essentially it was a new phenomena. And the, although the people who had the experience believed that they were real, um, the scientific reaction really uh, reflected people's own personal views, like much of what our perceptions about life and death is. If you were to go out there today and ask people what you'll find their perception about uh, what happens after death reflects their cultural beliefs, their religious beliefs, their personal beliefs, or a combination of. That's why there are thousands of opinions out there. But, but, but I want to so, jump in on one point, because it seems like there's a disagreement between what you're saying and what Well, I was Kevin about was to saying. touch on that, but I think okay. that's important just to get the fr framework of what, mm -hmm. where we're coming from. So now, what, what Kevin was mentioning, which I think is very valid, is, and this is what's been discovered more in the 21st century, um, is that essentially after a person dies through the conventional ways, which is, and it's defined in two ways. One is what I just described, which is circulatory failure when your heart stops. And I would say to you, as an intensive care physician, 95 to 99 percent of patients that we define write a death certificate for them, this is, how, this is the mode of death. Now, the other thing, though, that's happened is that when those people have died, what we now understand is that those brain cells don't immediately go through the process that Kevin just mentioned. They don't immediately disintegrate and disappear. There's a process that can take potentially hours. So now, understanding that, another dilemma that's come about, which is what Kevin was referring to through intensive care, is that you can have people who would have traditionally died by their heart stopping or breathing, but are now being maintained on life support machines in my intensive care unit, but have had massive brain injuries such that the brain itself can independently die 
before the heart has stopped. But, but just to, so I, that's I, I, brain death, but, and that's what Kevin was afraid. Okay, of. but it sounds like you're saying that people, in a clinical sense, have died, and in some cases through resuscitation, come back. And Kevin, you're saying that's not possible. I mean, uh, people have not died. Uh, they, you cannot come back from death. The term clinical death causes all kinds of confusion. And it causes confusion because people think, well, I can return from clinical death. No, death is death, you're, it's irreversible. I mean, once a cell dies, once an organ dies, it is dead. Now, as Sam points out, and rightfully so, if you have cardiac arrest, well, the brain's still working because it's gonna work for probably about 10 seconds, even with no blood flow. But oftentimes, particularly in the ICUs and in the field and when there's cardiac events, it's not so cut and dry. In fact, the heart starts up, it kind of slows down, or the, you know, the, you know, it, may, it may stop for a while, then start up again, it may beat ineffectively. Um, so there's all kinds of very important factors that go into, it will appear that someone is dead. They may, they may be comatose, they may have their eyes up, and they may be paralyzed, but they're not dead. But if I may and say to, though. And um, to call it clinical death, you know, in a scientific term, I think it lends itself to this particular people who are not medically sophisticated that there's a return from death. And then these are not a return from death experiences. These are a near death. You've, you've gone to the edge, but you haven't gone over the edge. But I think the people we deal with, actually, Kevin, do go beyond the edge. And that, that's the point. I mean, this is how death is declared in this country. It's basically when your heart stops beating, you have no breathing, and your pupils are fixed and dilated. That is the criteria for determining death in people. Now, what we're all saying is sort of similar, is that the social perception of death, and that's important, is that death has to be a point by which you cannot come back ever again. And that may be that we need to redefine the way we even issue death certificates in the future. But right now, and if you think about the guy who on the street right now potentially is having a car accident as being declared dead by ambulance crews who arrive there, that's the way that they have died. They haven't yet developed that permanent brain death. But that's how it's being done all over this city, all over this country, all over the world. So when you watch movies or you look at literature, when people talk about death or the perception of death that's how they, that's the majority that we're talking about. Right. Most of the time when I declare someone dead, um, I don't need to declare them brain dead. Their heart has stopped for a period of time to where you know the brain could not survive. But it's the brain surviving or not, which is the critical factor here. We're talking about the brain you know, during these experiences. When you speak to experience, when you speak the human experience, you're speaking about the brain. 